Good morning. My name is Elena Castro. I, I am a medical oncologist from the Spanish National Cancer Research Center in Madrid. And I am here in this e-cancer conversation with my colleague, Shanin Shandu from the Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Melbourne. And we are going to discuss about some of the abstracts presented at the ESMO 2019 uh, Congress. And we want also to see how this is going to be incorporated in the new ESMO uh, guidelines. So I, I suppose it's been a very exciting ESMO for me and I'm, I'm sure for you as well and for most of us that are treat prostate cancer because there's been a lot around uh, molecular diagnostics and also imaging as well in terms of trying to uh, molecularly dissect the prostate cancer and for the first time I believe we're starting to stratify the disease based on underlying molecular biology and being able to translate that information um, with new therapeutic agents that are, that are coming into the pipeline for our patients. Um, in particular, I suppose, I find that the, the understanding that a significant proportion of men with prostate cancer actually do have an underlying uh, homologous recombination DNA repair defect that could potentially be targeted, offering this men a new treatment is, is exciting. Um, and, you know, again, one of the challenges we are faced with is how do we find the subset of patients who would benefit from some of these new treatments. Um, and of course, you know, as you know, Elena, one of the challenges we face in the clinic all the time is uh, tissue and getting tissue for, for, for our men. It's not as, as straightforward for men with prostate cancer. But it was, it, it was instructive to see the uh, molecular data from the um, profound paper. So there was a molecular poster that was presented which looked at the landscape of mutations that they found and I found it quite instructive that we were able to use archival tissue um, both primary as well as metastatic tissue to identify some of these uh, genomic changes that could be targeted. Uh, and it was in intriguing that the, the, of course, with the metastatic tissue, the yield was slightly higher, but primary tissue was also valuable. And I think hopefully the assays will improve. There was a, about a third of patients who, you know, did not have a result, and I think we need to do better, and hopefully in, over time technology will improve as well. Um, and I suppose the other area that is really quite exciting but also raises lots of issues is around novel imaging. And, um, you know, particularly we know that prostate-specific membrane antigen is ubiquitously expressed on most prostate cancers, both treatment-naive as well as um, hormone-resistant prostate cancer. And in fact, the expression gets increased over time and they've been able to develop uh, what they call thermostics, which is looking at identifying the target in men with prostate cancer, uh, and then also creating a therapeutic, looking at uh, lutetium PSMA, and also other agents really like uh, bites uh, that target CD3 and PSMA that actually get to this target. So being able to again identify patients where this therapeutic sort of strategy of uh, targeting the vast majority of men with prostate cancer is also very exciting, um, but I really feel that we need to learn a great deal more about um, the implications of how we incorporate some of these novel Im imaging into our standard practices, uh, both and, and as well as the molecular testing as well, um, which we don't fully understand. I think the technology has moved well in advance of uh, us as a community thinking about how we implement some of these new things into clinical practice. But it is exciting times and lots of work to be done. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think in this ESMO, we have uh, finally entered the road of precision medicine for prostate cancer. And I completely agree that the challenge we have ahead is mostly a technical challenge. So how are we going to do this testing accessible for all the centers and therefore for all the patients? Mm -hmm. And what do you think will be the uh, way to move forward? Will it be tissue testing or will it be plasma testing? Yeah, so I, I think there's probably a role for both. Um, 
um, you know, certainly if we are able to use primary archival tissue um, at the time of, uh, you know, for men with metastatic prostate cancer, we know the yield is reasonable. Um, but as I said, technologically, we need to improve the subset of patients who don't have those results. Um, understanding which proportion of patients actually have harbor a germline uh, mutation in addition to a somatic change within the tumor, I think is important, particularly relevant for cascade testing more broadly for uh, the, the men with prostate cancer who might have, you know, female daughters. Identifying a BRCA mutation in a female daughter has significant implications. So how do we start to look at some of these things? So I think really um, probably it would be archival tissue and, and plasma is very useful in that it allows a global representation, but perhaps the limitation there can be sometimes the sensitivity if the tumor burden is very low. Um, and these platforms are not well established globally. Uh, you know, they so far have been established at academic centers, and so the, the challenge of how do you roll this out so that um, you know, it becomes broadly available for men with prostate cancer, which is what we ultimately want. Mm -hmm. And what is your impression on how all these new uh, results and advantages are being implemented in clinical guidelines? For instance, in Europe, the uh, updated clinical guidelines now recognize the utility of uh, PSMA PET, but they also acknowledge that this is not uh, available for all institutions. This guideline also recommends germline testing for all patients with metastatic disease, but we will need to see whether this is affordable for all the uh, all the national health systems and there's also always the discussion on whether of course a tissue screening is relevant for patients and is recommended but obviously how are we going to do that how are the guidelines in Australia or in other so um, you know one of the challenges you're, you're completely right I think the, the the first I suppose tackling the germline question you know, I, I certainly believe that when the incidence is about 10% or 12% of finding a, a target uh, that could potentially benefit patients, I think there's significant value in offering patients germline testing and the cost of these tests have gone down considerably and there must be, you know, significant clinical and economical benefit of identifying um, patients, family members who might also harbour some of these germline changes and impacting their cancer care. Uh, so I think there's significant value. The challenge we're faced with with Australia is how do you reimburse it? So again, it's largely fallen on academic institutions where we've set up uh, panel testing for a subset of men, but how do we more broadly implement this? And, and also, how do we integrate with uh, the genetics counsellors? Because I think they would be overloaded if we actually sent them every single man with prostate cancer ahead of screening. And so working with them to create some gui national guidelines, I think, is going to be critical as, you know, as increasingly uh, these these sorts of things are implemented. So I think that's sort of you know the challenge with germline testing, and I, I feel that if we are testing archival tissue and we find uh, you know a, a biallelic deletion, then I think we have an obligation to make sure that there is that there is a component or follow up in making sure that that germline component is followed up because it's got such clinical significance both for the individual patient but also for the broader family members. So that's the germline uh, aspect of it. The PSMA imaging, I think, is, is, is more challenging at the moment because of, you know, it's not routinely available. And uh, certainly in Australia, you know, it's certainly been taken up very broadly. And it's not uncommon to have a patient turn up to clinic with a PSMA PET scan that's been done mm -hmm. already, often by the urologist. So what we're starting to see is patients with who we were previously would have said was M not, but now we're defining uh, evidence of small volume PSMA avid disease and trying to sort of understand the biology of that and how we are impacting treatment uh, is important because you know there's there's the possibility we are creating anxiety, uh, but maybe you know offering these patients earlier treatment may or may not be useful. Certainly, the clinical trials 
uh, and the evidence has not actually incorporated any of this imaging technologies uh, at the moment. So lots of work needs to be done. Uh, what some of my colleagues in Australia, um, Professor Michael Hoffman, in fact, is leading uh, a very exciting imaging study looking at comparing uh, lutetium PSMA imaging versus conventional imaging uh, in high-risk men prior to surgery. So really trying to sort of optimize uh, the patients who undergo surgery and, you know, not offering surgery for patients who've actually got metastatic disease. So that's one place where I think there's a role and certainly for me it's, you know, there's a very important role of PSMA imaging as a way for signal seeking studies. If you have got a new target, one of our challenges with drug development in prostate cancer has been always to try and identify the activity of the drug. And now we've got these exciting functional imaging and we might be able to look at that signal in a more robust way. And, you know, I would encourage pharma to incorporate some of these, uh, some of these imaging technologies uh, into their studies. And, you know, they're always going to be exploratory, but that's how we learn. So Elena, you know, there's been such excitement and so many changes um, in the field, both in terms of molecular imaging and also molecular testing, both germline and I think uh, increasingly we're seeing that somatic testing is also valuable in, in men with prostate cancer to personalize treatment. And I'm, uh, of course, you know, I'm very intrigued uh, about how these new changes that are actually evolving uh, are going to be uh, incorporated into the ESMO guidelines. Yes, the ESMO guidelines have been uh, recently updated precisely to uh, include all these changes in the management of prostate cancer, of course, but also in the diagnosis, both uh, imaging and molecular diagnosis. So um, these guidelines now recognize the, the utility of PET PSMA particularly after this is relapsed uh, in patients who have previously had a uh, radical therapy for localized disease. But we also have to acknowledge that the PET PSMA is not widely available. So in some institutions, um, they are using it routinely, whilst in others, the penetrance of this technique is still poor. Um, the PARP inhibitors, uh, I think, have come, have arrived to stay, and now we need to identify who are the patients more likely to benefit from from these therapies. Therefore, the guidelines recognize the need for molecular screening in in these patients. Uh, the, these guidelines have an enter in which will be the more accurate technique, whether we should be using tissue or uh, uh, circulating DNA. Uh, obviously, because we understand this is something that will evolve and, and may change rapidly. But uh, definitely, this is something that in all health, uh, healthcare systems should be provided for uh, our patients and we need to put in place a strategy to um, provide this uh, type of molecular screening for all prostate cancer patients. Uh, and germline, with regards to germline testing, there is a clear benefit for patients with uh, uh, prostate cancer to be tested. As, as you know, we cannot identify upfront which patients are like, likely uh, germline mutation carriers, but the benefit not only for the patients in terms of therapies or follow-up, but also for their relatives is great as it could help to uh, uh, prevent or in some cases could be helpful for the early diagnosis of breast and ovarian cancer in the relatives. So the guidelines now recommend germline testing for all patients with metastatic prostate cancer. It's, um, it's a good time in, in prostate cancer and lots of advances. Yeah, lots of excitement. Thank you for listening to us. Hope you have enjoyed this conversation and hope to see you soon.